Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today for our CodeTrip webinar about building apps with microservices. I'm Manuel Weiss, co-founder and director of marketing here at CodeTrip and the manager of our webinar program. Joining me today is our customer success engineer, Ethan Jones. At CodeTrip, Ethan is responsible for introducing users to our CI infrastructure for Docker and helps solving all of your support tickets. Today, Ethan will give an introduction on how to build web applications with microservices. He'll start off with a basic explanation of what microservices are and what they are not, when they could make sense for your team, and how to best approach getting started with using microservices. There are a lot of advantages, but implementing a microservice architecture can also lead to quite a few challenges, and Ethan will talk about these as well. The presentation will take about 30 minutes and will collect questions during the talk. And I will also post helpful material into the chat, like links to blog posts that Ethan is mentioning, ebooks, other webinars, etc. So just keep an eye out for that. And after Ethan's presentation, we will then do a 15 minute dedicated Q&A session where he will try to answer as many questions as possible. Lastly, I also want to mention that we are recording this presentation and we will send you the video and other relevant material, links, slides, etc. Uh, later today. So let's get started. I'm happy all of you are here and I'm handing over to you, Ethan. Thanks, Manny. So today we're going to be taking a look at what microservices are. We're going to talk about what they're not. We're going to talk about how your team can think about them how you can approach using them, and just some things to keep in mind as you start to head down that path. Now, one thing I want to mention is here at CodeShip, we do webinars every month, and that's things like introductions to new technologies like what we're doing today, all the way down to some deeper, more technical and specific implementation level content. So today, since this is an introduction to building your apps with microservices, we're going to be focusing a lot on concept. We're going to be focusing a lot on things to keep in mind, discussions to have, and ways to think about the problem. So if you're already very familiar with microservices or very experienced with them, you might find that you've covered a lot of this already, and that's fine. This might make for a good refresher for someone on your team, or maybe your team has already gone down this path, but you were so focused on building and getting things shipped that you didn't have a lot of time at the start to pull back and think conceptually about exactly where it was you're heading. So maybe this would make a good reminder and a good pause and discussion point for your team as well. So the first thing I want to talk about is what microservices aren't, and then we'll spend a lot of time talking about what they are. But if we talk about what they're not, this is helpful because you've probably read a lot of things out there on microservices. You see a lot of blog posts and a lot of great information around the web, and it can be easy to start to get confused with some of the different definitions or some of the technologies you hear. So just to clear things up a little bit, microservices are not Docker. And incidentally, Docker is not containers, and therefore containers are not microservices. And so what we mean here is Docker itself is a technology for managing and orchestrating containers. Containers are a technology for helping make your code more portable and easy to maintain and swapping out your environments and things like that. You hear these things in conjunction with microservices quite often. A lot of times teams that are doing one are also doing the other, and a lot of writing will speak of them as if they're interchangeable almost but they're not necessarily interchangeable. Microservices fundamentally are a way to think about your architecture. It's a way to design your application and a way to think about what you're building and how you build it. Containers are a technical concept and a technology you can use to help support your microservices. And Docker is a specific flavor of containers. Now another thing about microservices is they're also not about size. So a lot of times when you read about microservices, you'll see a lot of writing about really small code bases and the fact that you can make these really tiny specific applications. And that's great, but it's really not about how small you can make your code base or how small of a footprint your application can take up. 
your application needs to be as big as it needs to be, even if it's a microservice application working with a whole bunch of other microservice applications. You shouldn't feel any pressure to reduce the size of your application arbitrarily because what we're talking about is small applications that work together. We're not talking about applications that are by file size or by lines of code tiny. And the other thing here is microservices are not a solution for bad code. And maybe this is more fair to say they're not a solution for bad situations. So maybe your team has found itself after a bunch of deadlines or maybe some core assumptions you had in place ended up not working out in the best case scenario. And maybe you've ended up with a code base that you're kind of worried about maintaining long term or that's getting very, very difficult to work on. And maybe you're looking at microservices and you're starting to see that a lot of people recommend microservices as a great way to approach a more sustainable and a more maintainable code base. And that's all true, but microservices themselves are not going to be an issue, or not going to be a solution, rather, in a vacuum. Microservices require the same level of planning, and possibly more planning, the same level of thinking ahead, and making sure that you're planning for future efforts and planning for future changes, as any traditional monolith or web stack development would require. Just switching to microservices alone is not going to guarantee that you don't end up in a mess down the road. That takes good habits and planning ahead. Now we're going to talk about what microservices are next. So first, microservices are a design pattern. I mentioned this earlier when I said that they're not a technology, they're not Docker, they're not containers. And that's because microservices are, again, a design pattern. They're an architectural concept. Microservices ultimately happen as much on the whiteboard as they do in your code itself. So when we talk about microservices, what we're talking about is rather than having one big core application that does everything you need to do, you can probably have a whole bunch of smaller applications, individual pieces of your applications. Maybe payments is one application. Maybe one user role is another application. And then through things like normalized APIs between your different services, you have them communicate and simulate the effect of one complete top to bottom web application. So it's this concept of building smaller pieces and plugging them together rather than building one beginning to end specification for your full working app. And so think about Legos. Now Legos is an overused metaphor in the development community and I'm aware of that, but I still think it makes a really helpful mental model in this case. Obviously with Legos you take a whole bunch of pieces, some of which are use case specific, you put them together, and at the end of it, you have a model that works, looks like you want it to, and does what you want. If that same model was built from a single cast, it would be really hard to swap anything around or repair anything because it's one body frame. With Legos, you can take a piece off, you can put it back, you can change the configuration of one area without messing up, messing up another area, and you can't do that if you're again building a model from a single cast, which is maybe a helpful way to think about a traditional monolithic type app. So with microservices, we're saying, how do we build pieces that can plug and play? If we're gonna build payments for application, how do we build a payment service that can support anything we might need to do with payments down the line, rather than just what we need to do with payments for this one specific user behavior today? And then I want to add here that microservices are a spectrum. And what I mean by that is there's no canonical or ideal definition you have to meet. It's very easy to read about microservices and to start to see all the different things out there and all the nice graphs explaining how they work and really start feeling the pressure to deconstruct your application into 10 really cleanly defined services that all have REST APIs. And you can take that a little too far depending on what size of team you have and what your development goals are and how familiar you are with these concepts today. 
So when we say microservices are a spectrum, what we mean is it's okay to be microservice-ish. It's okay to find a mild starting point and just go with that. Since it is a concept ultimately, there's a lot of benefits from even partial implementation of the concept. You don't need to match some post or some technical definition of what microservices means for a lot of these things to start to be useful and to start to bear fruit inside your team. And now incidentally, we have this blog post over here that's gonna cover some of these concepts and some of these best practices. So Manny's gonna share this in the chat. We have a few blog posts I'll be mentioning throughout this webinar today. And Manny will be posting all of those as I do and they will be available after the webinar as well. So when we talk about how it's a spectrum and there's a lot of good ideas and you can pull out the ones you want or the ones that make sense for your team, a blog post like this is going to help isolate what those good ideas and what those best practices are so you can make the best use of the ones that make sense for your team at any given point. Now when I say it's a spectrum, I think this is a good way to think about it because we've got two different designs here, two different ways we could implement our application. Let's say today we're starting with a standard monolith. So everything is just one code base and then I've got my environment set up and configured to work with my application. If I want to start approaching microservices, a lot of times I'll start looking at something like what we see on the left. And this is a little simplified just to make it easy to digest today. But let's say what I've done here is I've taken some of the core functionality of my application, my administrative component, my payments, my front end, my marketing landing pages, all my notifications, and the vendor management for my users. And I've broken those out. So now instead of one application, I've got six applications. And I'm probably maintaining these through something like Docker images. I could be using separate repos as well, or I could be doing both. So now I've got six separate services, probably six separate Docker images. They work exactly like my code base started because here in the middle I've got APIs for them and they're all communicating through these standardized APIs to replace all the nested logic and all of the dependent logic they had when they were part of one project. The problem with this thing we see on the left here is if I'm starting with an application that's already built out or if I'm a relatively small team, it might take me a really long time to be able to build this. This is now six applications, six set of tests, maybe six different environments that they need to be served in. It's six API layers. This can be a hassle for a small team to maintain, or it could just take me way too long to get my app deconstructed to this level, and I'm starting to wonder why I'm even going through the trouble if it's gonna be this long of a cycle. And that's where we can see something like what we see here on the right. So this is not nearly as intensive. It's much simpler. Now simpler as in simpler to work on, simpler to get to this point, but it is still a fully functioning app, of course, and it's still gonna have a lot of the benefits that microservices give us. So if we look at what we're doing over here on the right instead, we've taken all six of these guys, and they're still part of one core application. So I've got one app service, it's still all of my logic, probably it's a Docker image just for this. Now what I've done is I've taken my database logic, I've put that into another service, probably another Docker image. And the same thing with Redis down here, and the same thing with everything it takes to test and deploy my application, which before this was either not part of my code base or it was just some scripts for deployment and orchestration that I'm storing in my code or it was maybe just some manual commands that people on our team know we need to run. But now I'm able to standardize those, store them in a Docker image, store all of my database setup and migration. Same thing with Redis. So here I've got six services with a common API layer. Over here I've got four services two of which were just part of my environment before, but now I'm taking them a little bit more into my architecture, and I'm also standardizing my test and deployment strategies. So this is also microservice-ish. This is a great use of Docker and containers and a great use of microservice sort of thought, and you can probably imagine how you could get to this point 
much quicker than how you get to this point and that's totally fine to start here and then see if getting over here ever makes sense for your team. Now I want to take a look at a quick code example over here and so what we're looking at is actually exactly what we see on the right and this is specifically a code ship services YAML file which means it's the YAML file that our CI CD product for docker based applications uses but it's actually also just a docker compose file so this is a standard file you might see out there if you're using docker to maintain your microservices which a lot of teams are and it's just sort of a helpful blueprint for what this in a chart might look like when you're actually defining it over here so you can see what I'm doing is I'm defining my core service I'm calling it app it's building a docker file and then it's linking over here to Redis, Postgres, and testing. Now down here I've got my testing, so this is where my testing and my deployment logic would be. And you can see it's actually going to build a different Docker file. Now the interesting thing here is sometimes with microservices you want to store your code in separate repos. And you want to have those deploy separately, maybe test separately, orchestrate separately and that's one common approach that works great. Here we could do something where we even have a, all of our code in a single repo. We may not even need to do very much to deconstruct it on day one because you can see what I'm doing here is I'm actually using something like a docker file which is just a blueprint for defining my docker image. I'm actually using a docker file to carve one repo up into multiple services. So in this docker file I would say add all of my application directories and files but I would not add all of my testing or my deployment logic directories and files. Now down here in this docker file I would add those other directories and files the ones related to testing and deployment. So even if it is a unified code base just through docker files I'm able to make it a little bit more microservice-ish and now I've got two separate images which is great because my development team can say give me just the code or give me the code and give me the testing and deployment or however I choose to break that up. Now I'm also defining Redis and Postgres here and in this case we're just going with vanilla Redis and Postgres but this is great because I can control versions and I can standardize across anywhere my application is being run so now Redis and Postgres themselves become architectural choices not just environment dependencies but let's say I had a whole bunch of migration logic or seed logic that I had. I could easily do something like this just for Postgres. I could say this is a different image right here. And now I'm also building a third image just for my database that could grab the Postgres base image and add my custom commands, my seeding or my migrations or whatever I need to do with my database. So this is just a very simple way to look at how would I actually get to this point if I have my code repo but I want to deconstruct it a little bit make it a little more portable a little bit more microservice in nature and I don't want to change very much you can do that very quickly with something like we see here docker compose file and you can see it's not that complex to really start going down the path this is a file on our product we would use to help drive your CI CD process so that we could replicate your application. It's also a file you could use in your production or on your other developers machines so that they could also replicate your application. Then we do also have another blog post that Manny will share in the chat here specifically on hosting your microservices in production. So if you want to start shipping microservices and getting them out into the wild whether it's the complex version or the more simplified version, this is a good blog post that will help orient you on some of the basics around that. So now we've talked about what microservices aren't. Hopefully you also have a fairly good idea of what we're talking about when we say microservices. And again, the reason I focus so much on that last part is I wanted to clarify that I don't always mean the classic complex definition of microservices. I just mean applying some of these deconstructive concepts to your app and to your team so that you can start making gains. So now that we know a little bit more about that, why should you be using microservices? So here's some words you see a lot out there relating to microservices. Maintainable, portable, faster, agile, more versatile, scalable, 
on and on. And these are all true. So these are all side effects of a good microservice implementation, whether complete or whether partial. And the reason ultimately that you see these words is it just comes down to the fact that we're talking about smaller standardized applications. And not smaller in file size or lines of code necessarily, but smaller in terms of what they're doing. An application that only routes payment requests is gonna be easier to work on than finding payment logic nested and embedded deeply within my monolithic application. So just by deconstructing things, just by pulling things apart a little bit, I know I can make changes faster, that I can worry about downstream consequences less. So these are all good reasons, and if you find that it is difficult to make changes to your application without breaking things, if you find that there's a lot of time spent orchestrating environments, if you find that there's a lot of organization knowledge required to work on your application, it's very hard for someone from the outside to get up to speed in a useful time period, or it's very hard for a new developer to get up to speed in a useful time period. So then these are all really good signals that maybe you should be looking at something like the microservices concept for your application and team. So the opposite of these are sort of the symptoms you're looking for if you want microservices to jump out as a good potential solution. Microservices also let you focus a lot more on technology fit. And this definitely gets talked about, but it might actually be one of the quieter and more important things that can really make a big difference. So if you're building your application as a monolith, if you're building it as a single stack, then you have to make some core choices up front about language, environment, framework, tooling, external services. And obviously that's oversimplified because you can use different languages, you can use different tools, but it gets much, much more complex when everything is dependent and part of a single application. By breaking things up into smaller services that are truly separate applications, you can start to say what really makes sense for each individual constituent piece of my application. What environment, what language, what tool makes sense for the exact problem this service is solving? And as long as you have something like standardized APIs to handle most of your communication, you can usually avoid a lot of incompatibility problems because that's not where a lot of the dependent logic happens. Now you still have to worry about some compatibility and interoperability problems, but not nearly as much as you would if everything was fully integrated. And so you have much more control over how you optimize, over what you want to use, and you don't end up in these situations where you would really like to implement just this one piece a certain way, but you know you can't without changing five other things or breaking five other things. So technology fit is a really good reason to look at microservice approaches. If you find yourself saying, I wish I could use this, but it's not compatible with X, Y, or Z, or I really want to try this tooling out for this problem, but then I'd have to go change X, Y, or Z. That's another strong sign that microservices might be very useful for you where you're currently at. And so then how do you do it? How does your team actually get from zero to one in terms of picking up the ball and running with microservices? And it's not too hard to get started. So what we do is we recommend you audit your current application or your application specifications. You sit down and you make a list of everything you're doing, everything you need to do, plan to do, and want to do. And what you're looking for is you're looking for a list of potentially deconstructible services. You're looking for things that you could theoretically build in isolation and then make communicative with one another. So what are, what are those deconstructible services look like? So one rule of thumb that's helpful is, if I built this by itself, could I have an API for it that would make the rest of my app work just fine? And if the answer is yes, if you can envision this piece not being connected and an API being good enough, if you can envision if only a third party service gave me an API for this, then that's a good signal that you're looking at something deconstructible. And then there's some other really common things to look for. So does your application have notifiers, user notification or admin notification systems? Those are probably deconstructible. 
Things like front end, back end, or user interface modalities are quite often deconstructible. Anything related to deployment, orchestration, testing, provisioning, integrity checking, all of that can usually be spun out to a separate service. You shouldn't need anything, anything to guarantee the health or uptime or release of the code shouldn't need to be baked directly into the application itself. That should be separable. Anything related to payments is often separable. And anything related to user roles is worth looking at. If you have a two-sided marketplace application, can your storefront owners be one service and the end customers are a different service? So all these things make for good consideration and good discussion within your team. And we have another blog post, again, which Manny will share in the chat, that also walks you through the process of thinking about decomposing that monolith as a good way to get started. Now, one thing I want to caution here is crawl before you walk. And what I mean by that is it's really easy to say, okay, cool, I can see five different services in my application. I can see exactly how this is going to solve the problems I have today. This is the right call. We should go do it. The issue with that can sometimes be not fully, not fully appreciating some of the downstream costs or downstream complexity of these sorts of choices. So crawl before you walk, what I mean by that is maybe it's best to start off with just spinning a single piece out. Let's say you're just going to take payments or you're just going to take your front end and you're going to make a single separate service with a single API. At the point where you've gone through that process, it is now live, it's in production, everyone's happy with it, it's working well. Then maybe you could look at, okay, let's take one and turn it into five services. But going from one to five, if you've never done it before, is setting yourself up at a pretty high risk of running into a lot of unexpected consequences and unexpected risks. So maybe find one deliverable, start there, and when you've done a good job with it and you feel comfortable, go further. And so I skipped a slide here, but so I mentioned risks a moment ago, and I do want to talk about some of those risks because like I said, you want to take it slow because there are certainly risks you can bump into along the way. And if we look at the first and most obvious of those, it's not thinking ahead. And I mentioned at the start of this that Microservices are not going to inherently solve any core problem because something led to the problems. Some lack of discussion or some core assumption or some technology change. Microservices, when well considered, can set your team up for a lot of success down the line and avoid a whole lot of issues and headaches, but you definitely need to sit down and think about where you're making trade-offs. With microservices, you're going to have more to maintain. So more separate projects, possibly more host environments, possibly more technologies and languages. You might have more code because now you have to worry about API layers that you didn't have to worry about before. And do you have the resources to maintain these? If you're looking at, I could do this as one big app plus one small service or five small services, what's going to be easier for your team to maintain long term, not just what is the most ideal implementation. So that's a great conversation to have very candidly internally as you head down this path. And you should also plan for challenges. So there are some common things you do, testing, working with databases, connecting to or external services. These are things you're doing today that are going to be slightly different when you take on a microservices approach. Maybe now you have a testing framework or you have test implementation, it's working great, but you're gonna to need to test for all your services and you're gonna to need to test that they're all working together successfully. So you have some new levels of test abstraction or test complexity you have to think about. Maybe you're going from one database to multiple databases, maybe even multiple database technologies. And if different services are focused on the technology fit, you might end up with more external services you end up having to work with or rely on. So these are all things that you might take for granted because you're doing all of them, but they are going to be slightly different as you adapt to a microservice approach. And you just want to make sure you're considering that. And then, of course, APIs to connect things 
means you have a lot of experience building and maintaining APIs. It's not the most difficult thing in the world, but you want to make sure that you're giving it some thought and really considering how important good API design is going to be to normalizing a successful microservice application long term. And that's pretty much it. So we've got all these blog posts that we can share with you. So make sure you have more info and some good places to go from here. We again recommend as a starting point that you just start discussing this with your team. Do this audit. Sit down and make a risk rewards trade off and just figure out what makes sense for you from here. So I'm going to hand it back to Manny now and then we'll have time for a brief Q&A with the minutes we have remaining. Thanks, Ethan. So yeah, um, as Ethan mentioned, just a quick wrap up from my side before we start the Q&A. Um, so Ethan explained the basics of microservices and what they are and what they are not. And he gave a good pointers on how you can start looking at deconstructing your monolithic app should you and your team decide to actually go forward into that direction. So you have to decide if you really want to do that. Um, but he also explained that you should think about external services in relation to your microservices and some more important things. And I hope you learned today that microservices can help you to potentially set up a better structure for your CI and CD processes. And I also posted a few links to helpful eBooks we published at CodeShip about this topic. And, and at CodeShip, we are not just um, doing webinars and publishing eBooks, but we are also building a CI and CD services, service with microservices best practices in mind. And you could see very briefly on the screen that um, Ethan gave a short um, peek into how that service works and how it looks and, and what we are building here at CodeShip. So if you're intrigued about it and want to learn more about it, um, I want to encourage you to just give it a try and check it out. Go to our homepage, sign up for the free plan, we are always happy to start a conversation with you about your needs. Um, yeah, and, and just read a little bit about it on our homepage and feel free to sign up for the free plan if you want. Um, and if that is too early for you, just check out some free ebooks and join us in our upcoming webinars. Um, yeah, as mentioned earlier, I will send out an email with the video recording and the presentation um, slides and some more helpful links and materials from this webinar later today. But enough from me, let's start with the Q&A session now. So I'm handing back over to you, Ethan. Awesome, thanks, Manny. So I'm gonna go in here and see what kind of questions we have. David asks, is it possible to use microservice architecture for open source software like WordPress? Uh, that's a really good question, and the answer is a lot of times yes. To what degree depends a lot on how that core open source software is built. WordPress, for example, you can do a lot with Docker implementation to at least do things with your databases, possibly with your test coverage. Um, if you're dealing with client sites, for instance, you can get a lot of flexibility out of things like deployments or standardizing new installs or updates to WordPress by taking a Docker or a microservice approach. You can't typically deconstruct WordPress itself, but all the associated things you have to do with it to make it work can be fairly easy, easily adapted to a microservice type approach. And David also asked, when you spin up a microservice for a database, how does it look like to import data? And that's kind of up to you. So again, the approach I was looking at here, and this is sort of designed for how CodeShip does things, you could have a Docker file, for instance, if you're using Docker, and this could have all of your typical database setup commands. If you're not using Docker, if you just have persistent databases, either locally or in production, nothing might need to change except possibly how your application makes its database calls. Because maybe now those are going to be routed through an API or routed through another service, but the database itself probably doesn't need to change how it handles the data. And Deepak says, that they optimize the how do you optimize the dependency between the components? Will the network not be a single point of failure for applications composed via microservices? How must we architect and design the application so that we are insulated from disturbances and vulnerabilities on the network? That is a really, really good question. And I slightly touched on it when I mentioned making sure that 
you're thinking about what goes into building and maintaining an API. Because if everything is happening through an API or through some controller or mesh layer between your services, you want to make sure that's got some redundancy to it. You want to make sure it knows how to handle failures. You want to make sure it knows how to handle timeouts, that it's not brittle. Now, it sounds very complex when I say it that way. For a lot of applications, it's really not that complex. There's not that high degree of risk or failure. And if you're talking about services all running on the same production machines or all running on very high quality production infrastructure, your occurrence of networking issues is probably going to be fairly low or fairly mitigated to start with. But you definitely do want to consider this. If there are some serious consequences to user behavior or financial costs associated to requests potentially timing out, or the API not handling requests correctly, you definitely want to make sure you're considering things like retries on requests, how you handle handshakes between services. All of those things are really important things to consider. I would say you're not that hamstrung by network vulnerability, um, because if you're hamstrung by network vulnerability with microservices, you probably are in any standard application anyway, because database calls are still going to go out and be reliant on the network, external services, serving assets, all of that's going to be reliant on the network with or without microservices. So you're not going to necessarily be at a higher risk because of network instability, but you definitely have a higher need to plan for things like routing requests and communication. Anthony says, can you elaborate a bit more on how different user roles can be implemented as microservices? Yeah, so that's one thing you can look at. It doesn't make sense for every application. But again, in a two-sided marketplace where, let's say, I have an e-commerce platform where people can set up stores and other people can buy for them, it might make sense that what the e-commerce store owner sees is one application and what the actual customer browsing the storefront marketplace sees is another application. And there's a few different uh, situations in which this might make sense. If I have some sort of hiring platform, maybe a job seeker is one service because they have some core functionality that doesn't overlap with the core functionality of somebody posting a job. So these are things where I might not need them dependent or I might not need them merged together with a higher degree of complexity because what we're really looking at is separate applications with enough commonalities that we really need them to communicate. Rafal says he has a concern about granularity and how it should be communicated, how request over services should be managed to not kill performance. For instance, he has a user entity which could be shared between multiple services and how should he achieve that? Write it over and over again or share it as a service. Granularity will kill performance. So this is a good question because it gets into the fact that there is a whole range of technical complexity and there is a whole range of team sizes and scope of project. So if you're at the level where you're really worried about granular performance of write requests or you're really worried about machine load and some of the more complex or more detailed things you might need to manage, then you definitely want to plan for those things in microservices as well. So if you need assets to be stabilized across multiple services, you probably really do want to consider an architecture that doesn't require you to write those over and over and over or to send redundant calls across multiple services. You might need some central or controller logic or a service that acts sort of as an air traffic controller so that you're not just ping-ponging things around. There's no real right way to do it. Um, and again, this is where I mentioned earlier microservices are a spectrum because you're ultimately just trying to solve your problems. But in this case where you have some pretty detailed performance needs and some pretty detailed performance concerns, you want to look at what are the trade-offs. And is there a service that could better handle this more than just having all of our services communicate? Or are there some things that don't make sense to deconstruct until we can solve that specific problem? Artemis asks, will each microservice have its own continuous deployment, assuming it's a separate image? That's another really good question, because the answer is it could. 
Now with CodeShip, for instance, we have a CI CD product. Um, since it's based on Docker, a lot of our customers are using microservice type approaches. And it's fully, uh, we built it with the idea that you can have one CI CD pipeline that can serve all of your services from centralized repos, no matter how many images you need to test or push or deploy. You could easily have separate CI CD deployments as well. Different test pipelines, different projects, whether on CodeShip or any other platform. So it really comes down to what you want to do, which maybe is kind of a cop-out answer, but there's no reason it has to have its own continuous deployment. You could have them all deployed together. You could do something like use different branches to deploy different pieces of it. You could say, if any piece of it changes, I'm going to redeploy all of it. Or you could say, I want really granular control, and at that point, I want separate continuous deployment processes for each individual service. Ian says, why do many providers insist on using different YAML formats? This fosters vendor locked in. I can't use the same Docker Compose on CodeShip, Rancher, etc. It's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think it ultimately comes down to just what the service supports. So we support Docker Compose as closely as we can. Ultimately, what you're doing in CI CD is probably going to require some customization that customization from what you're trying to do when you run your application locally. So it's going to be really, really hard to say you never need a separate YAML file for CodeShip because otherwise you're going to have to run CI CD exactly what you're doing locally, which may not, in fact, oftentimes isn't what you want to do locally. With locally, you're not trying to deploy to an external production resource. In CodeShip, you are and your YAML file needs to account for the difference. So it's not so much lock-in, which again is why we work as closely to Docker Compose as we can. It's more just necessity of what the tool is solving that sort of means we have to allow some options that you won't find in other use cases. See, there's a lot of good questions in here. I'm trying to pick the ones I know I can answer quick enough that we can get through a few of them. And we've only got a couple minutes left here. Brent says, would you add load balancing to as many service layers as possible? Again, you could. You absolutely could if you need to. You don't have to. You could take the pieces that are going to absorb most of the requests and load balance them and maybe not eat the costs of putting that load balancing on some of the pieces that have more controlled requests or that you'll be able to throttle more directly. That just comes down to what makes sense and what you think the capacity for the different services to absorb those requests are. And Luis says, what is a good way to set different properties to dev Q&A in production? I assume this means like environment variables or different infrastructure like that. Our biased answer is going to be Docker solves that problem very, very easily. We're big fans of Docker. There's other ways you can do it, but using Docker, using images, using Docker Compose, you can very quickly standardize different environments with no trouble. It looks like we're more or less out of time on questions, but there are a handful of good ones left in here. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that we try to get some follow-up information handling the rest of these questions out there. There's a lot of great information on microservices around the web, so we do recommend you go out there and do it. We'll try to put up some additional links as well. And for everyone else who's got a question here, we will try to get back to you with some follow-up information. Cool. Uh, thanks, Ethan. Um... Yeah, a lot of questions in the Q&A section. Um, and as Ethan mentioned, um, when we send out the video recording, we will have a section on that page with helpful material. And I will try to come up with a few links that answer a bunch of the question, questions from the Q&A session. Obviously, the super specific ones we cannot really answer. But feel free to always email me, manuel at coachup.com. And I can see if we can help you with your specific requests. Um, yeah, that's it from our side today. Um, thanks everyone for joining. I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you soon again.
Bye-bye. Thanks, Charles.